Indiana, USA. These H blocks house 30,000 dairy cows. The sheds are half a kilometer long and the fields around them are empty. That's because cows here rarely step outside. To their promoters, they're a brave new world in dairy farming. To their critics, they're milk factories. What's certain is that mega dairies are now established fixtures of American agriculture. And it started to happen here in Wales. A mega dairy farm housing 1,800 cattle has been operating in Carmarthenshire for over a year without full planning permission. And councillors in Powys are considering plans for a major dairy there. Is this the future for the Welsh dairy industry? We drink 700,000 litres of milk in Wales every day. But how many of us go beyond thinking whether to buy semi-skimmed or full cream? And what do we really know about where our milk comes from? The truth is, behind the rosettes at the Royal Well Show, dairy farmers say their prospects are far from rosy. With the industry at a crossroads, talk away from the arena was more about losing profits than winning prizes. In this programme, we'll be meeting three Welsh dairy farmers, all concerned about the future of their industry. I think dairy farmers have got a number of choices. Obviously, the first one is get out of the industry, which a lot are, you know, and I think currently there's about two leaving the industry every single day. Some farmers are going back to grazing their herds on grass, the traditional method. I think it's special at family farms because it involves all the families sometimes, you know, you get the son taking over. It's like an our farm, my, my wife does the milking, you know. <laughs> Other farmers are convinced that if the dairy industry is to have a future, herds need to be big, very big. So we thought we'd go out to the States and meet some of the best people out there. And I think we learned more in a week out there than I'd probably learned 10 years in farming home here. The average dairy herd in the UK currently numbers 112. Fraser Jones, who farms at Lower Leighton near Welshpool, has 200 cattle. His herd may be bigger than average, but the way he farms is typical of most dairy farmers in Wales. He lets his cows graze in the fields during summer, but to increase their milk yield, he feeds them processed food all year round. So this is the ration for the dairy cows. It's grass silage, maize silage, and concentrate, a bit of yeast and minerals um, with some molasses on top. And that's a typical dairy ration for, um, for the mid-lactation cows. A high proportion of the feed in this diet is bought in, leaving conventional dairy farmers exposed to volatile global markets. For the UK farmer, the, the, the raw materials that we need to feed our cows, such as wheat and barley and soya, rape, are going up in price, you know, and um, we can't control that. That's out of our control. You have to feed your cows, you know, at the end of the day, they have to be fed. Throw in high fuel costs and a low milk price, and dairy farmers like Fraser Jones are struggling to survive. Milk price is obviously a big issue. Uh, the milk price that we're receiving at the moment isn't sustainable and um, you know, farmers are expected to, to invest in their business and um, you know, the milk price we're receiving at the moment doesn't give you that extra to put back into the business. So dairy farmers have to further reduce their costs. One option is massively increasing the size of their herds to achieve economies of scale. It's a trail already blazed in the USA where herds can be tens of thousands strong. Sheds like these can be half a kilometre long. They're home to cows who are used to living indoors and to whom grass is quite alien. Dozens of calves are born every day and housed in hutches. Eventually they'll be old enough to take their place on the milk carousel. 
Howell Richards, owner of the biggest single dairy unit in Wales, is an evangelist for this big is beautiful approach. We hear time and time again, you know, large herds, there must be welfare issues, you know, you can't keep a lot of cows, you know, and not have problems. What shocked me when I first went to the States was how well their animal welfare was. He's installed a large rotary parlour like those in American mega dairies. He's also chosen a type of high yield cow, first bred in the United States, to produce more milk. I think the, the Holstein cow is a cow that um, has the potential to give a lot of milk. You know, there's no question they have been bred to give more milk than the, um, let's say for example, New Zealand Jersey or um, the British region. Howell Richards feeds his cows a diet of high energy processed food. It boosts their milk output so much that they need to be milked more often than conventional cows. The parlour is currently milking about 350 cows an hour. The aim here is that a cow is never away from her food, water or the ability to lie down for more than an hour at any one time. While the cows are being milked, their sheds are cleaned, new bedding is blown in and feed distributed. This is basically a cow's life, 365 days a year. Having seen this vision of the future for himself, Howell Richards was inspired to expand his herd. Although he's had 1,800 cattle for over a year, he still doesn't have planning permission for his new sheds. The idea of bringing American-style mega dairies to Wales is not supported by everyone. Alan Rogers farms near Wrexham. Faced with rising production costs, he and his wife Heather have gone to the other extreme. Between March and November, they graze their 160 cows on grass. They also grow their own winter feed, so producing nearly all their cows' food on their own farm. This reduces their costs substantially. Good girls, come on now. We try to produce as much as we can of grass, really. Come on, girls, good girls, come on. Go Going on, for low, on, low input, the cost of production was lower. So we were gaining extra pence for a per litre we, we, we produced. My father was born on a farm just up the road. Come on, Jess. When he retired at 65, he, he sold us his cows. So we were able to start up a dairy head and we had 25 to start. And then we've got built up to 160 now. Instead of the large Holstein cows that Howell Richards, Fraser Jones and many other dairy farmers favour, the Rogers have chosen a traditional type of cow. It's particularly suited to grazing grass, but produces a lot less milk. The cows are all bred from New Zealand Frisian, and then they're crossed with the Jersey Cross. You know, they're not big cows, they're quite little cows, but they last a long time. So, and I like my little cows. Um, we don't expect big yields from our cows, and yet we can make quite a good living as well out of it. Off you go. Go on, Alan. Go on. Alan and Heather buy in very little feed. During the summer, they use some of their land to grow food for their herd to eat during the winter. These forage crops not only provide protein for the cows, but also naturally replenish the soil, dramatically reducing the need for bought-in fertiliser. We found that the best forage crop to grow is oats and peas and they feed the cows in the winter because they're full of protein and the nitrogen goes back into the ground and this is the winter feed for the cows. High input and high yield or low input and low yield. The choices facing the dairy industry shed centre stage at the Royal Welsh Show. In his quest to secure a profitable future in Montgomeryshire, Fraser Jones has researched both options. I think there's room in the UK for all type and size of farm, you know, from a small family farm to a large farm, which is run more, you know, as a business, you know, as a, with a lot more employees. 
with a low low input system, cattle are grazed for an extended time. And therefore you haven't got the costs of buying your feed, but your cows are only gonna average six, six and a half, seven thousand liters per lactation per year. You know, well obviously on a high input system, you've got a lot more costs with, um, with shedding, uh, with feed costs, but uh, your cows will be averaging, you know, 10,000 litres a year. The extra volume in litres is paying for the extra costs. So overall profitability, there probably actually isn't much difference between the two, the two systems. The trouble is you can't have an intensive grazing system on every farm. Like every farm has got different soil types, different, you know, scenarios. So I, I was looking at um, intensive grazing or um, or a system which is more high input where cows are housed slightly longer. And for this particular farm, the high, high input, high, high output system, to me, is the most viable. And so Fraser Jones has opted to increase his herd fivefold and has applied to Powys County Council for permission to build a thousand cow dairy unit. To his critics, it's a mega dairy and the application has created quite a stir. Okay, so these are my plans um, of what I'm proposing to do at Lower Leighton Farm. I plan to put um, my parlour, which is going to go on this waste area just behind me, um, and then the cattle housing, which will be over there. The, the oak tree in the distance there is sort of the furthest point of the, uh, of the cattle sheds. So that's going to be my three sheds for cattle housing. And then at the bottom, down towards the road, is going to be the... Um, the fodder storage sheds, so my silage clamps, my maize clamps, and my uh, straw storage facilities. All manure is going to be um, pumped from the existing lagoon, which is just um, the other side of this waste area, into the new proposed um, slurry stores, which are going to be bottom side of the road behind that high hedge. Uh, and those are my basic, you know, that's the basic outlay of uh, the buildings I plan to, to put up. The dairy complex Fraser Jones plans has similarities with the large indoor herd which Howell Richards already runs near Carmarthen. Cows um, I envisage in this new system. She's literally walking from the shed to the parlour onto a rotary platform. She goes around with the platform and then walks back to the shed. So she will only be out of that shed for about half an hour. Generally, a cow, as soon as she goes, finishes milking, she goes back to the shed, she goes and eats. You know, they'll eat, they'll fill their stomachs up, and then they'll go and lie down in a cubicle. A basic cubicle is just over five, four foot wide and eight foot long. So, you know, she, she does spend a lot of time in that shed. I'd say out of, a, out of a day, she probably spends half of her day in a cubicle. But as I say, it's, you know, it's an environment which is very natural, you know, with plenty of airflow and um, you know, plenty, of, plenty of room to, to move about. Cows basically need lots of room. Um, cows should never be prisoners. The buildings that cows are in you know, are no different to what we would like to be in. I mean, you know, we all like to live in airy, well-lit rooms. We like to be fed regularly. We don't like too much change in our lives. Although Howell Richards is confident that his animals are healthy and happy in their airy sheds, some animal welfare groups aren't so convinced. Mega dairies are wrong for the cows, they're wrong for consumers, and they're wrong for the farming community. They're wrong for the cows because keeping cows uh, permanently or near permanently indoors uh, will cause them uh, health problems, uh, is likely to see their welfare suffer, and frankly, you know, denies the fact that cows belong in fields. You know, in the press you read about these cows that have been forced to produce all this milk. You, you can't force cows. You, you know, it's, it's total lunacy to say you can take a cow and force it and make it give a lot of milk. You know, the harder that you push a cow, the poorer that cow will be. The farmer wants the cow to be as happy as it possibly can. You know, it wants it to be in perfect condition and that you, know, you treat them right, they treat you right. And I don't think it matters how many numbers of cows you have, if you have a hundred cows or a thousand cows, each animal is still as important as the next. The reason these animals are kept permanently indoors or near permanently is that they're being pushed to their physical limits to produce ever more milk. 
they're being pushed to the degree that they're overproducing udder uh, means that their bodies can't keep up. These animals are no longer able to survive, to remain healthy on grass. Uh, and that is a serious health and welfare issue. It's not only my view, you know, the European Food Safety Authority uh, has said that uh, keeping uh, cows permanently indoors will m make them more likely to suffer from serious health problems. I think it's very sad that, um, you know, these people, you know, they should try, you know, and I'd be very happy for them to come and see, they, they want to look around these new units and how things are designed around the cow. Fraser Jones believes he's done this with the designs he's submitted. Even so, his application has proved controversial. Powys County Council has received 833 responses to the plans. 95% are against. I'd say the most negativity has been from campaign groups, um, you know, and it was it's quite, uh, quite daunting, if you like, and quite worrying, really, that um, people don't understand dairy farming. And um, I know with my particular application, we were having objections coming from America, New Zealand, Canada, Germany, France, pretty much every country you can think of, we had objections from, and they hadn't got a clue where Leighton was. They hadn't got a clue what I was actually doing. People just, you know, they're part of their, their campaign group and they just basically go on the internet, click a button and it, your objection is sent. Leighton residents know all too well where the mega dairy would be built. Some of them have formed a pressure group, the Campaign Against Leighton Farm Extension, CAF. Leighton's a small village, but this farm, it will be within a few hundred yards of something like 30 odd residences. You've also got the village hall here, which is the heart of the community. It's, it's going to just smother it. It's far, far too large for where it's proposed. When we consider that the school is a tiny little square there, and this is the sign of the development, should this farm be built, I think parents might be concerned about having sending their children to a school right next to this huge factory farm. The sheer amount of slurry that's going to be produced by these cows is immense. There's two slurry tanks. Each one will house this building. That's only four months' supply. It's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, is moving slurry, moving feedstuffs into the place, slurry out of the place. This is going to create a lot of traffic movement and no doubt smell and problems on the road. Mm. I, I appreciate that this site is a sensitive site. Um, I fully appreciate that. But I also feel that I have done everything, you know, to, to mitigate every possible scenario. It does cover, cover quite a large area. I don't dispute that, you know, so it is going to be visual. But I've screened it by having a bund and by having lots of plantations. And, you know, I ha have a commitment to slurry inject all my slurry. So all my slurry produced on the farm would be injected in the ground. I feel that, you know, we have got a proposal here that will not affect the local community in any way whatsoever. You see, that's where it's going to come to. So it's all go. of that area. It's just too out of proportion. A number of national organisations have also voiced their concerns. Well, if this application is approved, then what we're talking about is a really a completely stark industrial scale building huge sheds, great silo type arrangements, a great carousel on which cattle will industriously walk in and out of it without even probably seeing a blade of grass. It it's really is completely alien in terms of the traditional approach and the traditional feeling that a farm in this part of Montgomeryshire and in any part of rural Wales in the dairy sector would, would, would think of. I disagree with the campaign to protect the rural Wales. You know, I really do feel that what I'm proposing is not industrialisation. I totally disagree with them saying it's industrialisation. I feel it's a family farm which employs a lot more, you know, employs more people. When you have an industrial scale development of any sort, be it a farm, be it a business park, whether it was a prison, whatever you want to call it, it's an imposition in this landscape. And that's where our concerns are in respect of this particular application. I feel that Wales needs farming and it needs dairy farming 
and you know it needs to support these sort of applications. I really do. While Fraser Jones waits to hear whether planners will let him erect his mega dairy, Howell Richards is wondering if planners in Carmarthenshire will make him tear his two new sheds down. When we were building these sheds, we weren't looking at the risks you know, from the sort of planning side of things. I mean, we, we'd lost so much stock to TB, so the idea was to build this shed to house the cows three, six, five days, to take the animals away from the wildlife, and then if we could stop the link between the animal and the badger, then hopefully we would be free of TB. Howell Richards' decision to expand his dairy and only then apply for planning permission has upset some of his neighbours. The property I live in now overlooks Court Marley Farm and it is a blot in the landscape. Uh, I lived in a village for 26 years and uh, the last three years have been quite unbearable and because of the slurry coming from Court Marley. Avion Bowen has to advise the decision makers on the local authority. Uh, Kurt Malle is an existing farm complex, so you've got the farmhouse and, and the traditional uh, old stone buildings, uh, which, given today's agricultural practices, are suitable. But the two large proposed buildings, which are up, um, are rectangular structures, um, and they're located uh, just south of the, the farmhouse and the existing uh, milking parlour. Um, the buildings, as I said, are in situ. Um, and the, the construction proceeded even though um, the developer had been made aware that planning permission was required. How can people put up a building uh, and then say, well, I've built it now, what are you going to do about it? It's wrong, you know. It is a difficult concept to grasp, of course, but it's, it, you don't actually break the law when you actually build anything without planning permission. You only break the law should you not fail to comply with any subsequent enforcement notice. So these buildings, yes, they've been built, but we're now considering, obviously, to the, their impact on the landscape, impact on the local road network, and impact on the local environment as well. Yeah, the problem, how well he's got, he's got to transport all this feed in, all the slurry out, and that's what's causing a cigarette dealer problem in this community. Some of the issues with farms of this size is smell, uh, and it's certainly been an issue here. Um, to overcome that, we're actually now injecting slurry, and we've, we've been to see some of our neighbours who had issues with smell, and are now delighted with the results. The next stage forward for this farm would be to build an advanced anaerobic digester, what we're planning to do here is to use 100% waste product. It will take all the methane out of the slurry and then recycle it again and provide electricity for 1,200 homes. We've got to give um, Court Mallow Farms Limited credit because since we've started the, um, the campaign, he has started to inject his slurry, which has lessened the, the smells that the, the, the village is getting. Howell Richards might face planning problems, but the vet who visits his farm twice a week has no concerns about the welfare of his 1,800-strong herd. Cows are naturally inquisitive. Well, as you can see, you know, cows that are happy, they are inquisitive. Um, you know, these cows are not, have no problems with lameness. You know, they look healthy, they're in good condition. But good animal husbandry isn't a matter for the planners. If they won't approve the shed's construction retrospectively, Howell Richards could be forced to demolish them, removing the only mega dairy currently operating in Wales. But what's the future of the Welsh dairy industry? Low input grazing or a high input industrial approach? Pint sized or supersized? Alan Davis has the task of shaping the future agricultural policy of Wales. When I look at the Welsh dairy industry, what I see is an industry with absolutely enormous potential. When you look at the amount of milk that's actually produced in Wales, what you see is a great success story. 
farming is a very diverse industry and we see that in Wales perhaps even more, more so than in, in other parts of the United Kingdom or in other parts of Europe. We're always going to see, I hope, a, a central role for the family farm. I mean, that's a backbone of rural life in Wales in, in, in many different ways. And we will see other farms which are, are, are different in, in scale and, and, and different in nature. But, you know, as I, I don't see my role as a minister to make value judgments about what is good, what is bad, which way the industry should go. Also attending the Royal Welsh Show and prepared to voice strong views on the right future for the industry was the author and broadcaster, Graham Harvey. Basically, these intensive systems are unsustainable because to grow the feeds, the cereal crops, to feed the animals on, you have to have lots of fertilizers, lots of pesticides, and these need oil, which makes the whole system very oil dependent. Grass-based systems are much more self-sustained, much more sustainable. Farmers who produce milk on, although they're lower output systems, the inputs in terms of fertilizers and pesticides are much lower, which means that farms can be profitable year after year. Unless farmers embrace technology and move with the times, then there won't be farming in Wales. Simple as that, because we'll just import everything from Europe or wherever. The worrying thing for UK dairying, I feel, is that 40% of all dairy products now are imported, you know, which is a horrific figure when you think about you know, a country like the UK with 70 million people. In Wales, grass is the great natural resource. Something like 90% of the land area is actually under grass. And it's a no-brainer to feed grass to cows. I mean, it's the cheapest feed for cows. It produces the healthiest animals, and it actually produces the most nutritious milk. So why would we not use grass? There's nothing as more pleasing to the eye than seeing a herd of cows coming out of the milking parlour, being let out into the field, and frisking like young ponies. People have a very romantic view of farming, I think. You know, and you can talk a lot about, you know, people would like to see animals go out to grass and all the rest of it, but I think ultimately it's a business and it, it boils, a lot of it boils down to the milk price. You could put another two or three pence easily on a, a litre of milk for the uh, farmers and the farmers wouldn't expand so much. They wouldn't be this intensive. Mm. You know, you can't blame the, the farmers. They've been forced into this position by, by the price of milk. We pay more for a small bottle of water than what we do for a litre of milk. There's got to be something wrong in that, isn't it? If the proposals for mega dairies uh, are successful, I think that will set a very dangerous precedent. Uh, it will also uh, undermine the integrity of our milk. Who wants milk to be viewed on our supermarket shelves with the same suspicion that is currently afforded to battery eggs? Yeah, hopefully in, in 10 years' time we'll still be milking and making a reasonable profit and, you know, we're still producing what, what the consumer wants. Um, but I think we all need a price increase from our customers to maintain that, really, yes. Yeah, or a fair price against the cost of production. Because at the end of the day, the public dictate to the supermarket and the supermarket dictate to us. Like, it's, it's not really... You know, the farmers quite often say, you know, it's the supermarket's fault, but at the end of the day, they're only reacting to the public. The public have got the power.